tonight on the pole line with uh, Christy Schultz from Gowler or Gawler, depends on if what part of the country you're from, but um, how are you going tonight, mate? I'm good. Very good. Thank you. Now, you could probably wear a lot of hats in this interview, but to me, it's um, Christy the motorbike racer. So how does all this kick off? Like, how do you get into racing motorbikes? just stems from a long line of family history in racing. Um, my brother um, rides and still competes these days and my father was a speedway rider and my grandfather also used to race as well. So just from a long line of family history. Now, I do this with everyone and I'm never going to change this, but now's your time to promote your team uh, what you're doing, where you're doing it, but how do we find out about your racing and how do we keep track of it? Yep, so um, we do actually have a racing page. That's so Christy Schultz and Ayla Plowman um, racing page on Facebook. Um, so, yeah, we sort of put all our information on there and we participate in the reliability trials. So, yeah, we sort of give a bit of a rundown after every event and, yeah. Now, I've got to shout out your mum because... Yep. Without her, this wouldn't have happened. So um, tell us a bit about your mum. She's my biggest supporter, my number one fan and the number one babysitter um, for my little girl so I can go and do what I do. Obviously, being a single mum, it does make it a little bit hard to go and race. Um, and obviously, with what our racing, each event is a minimum of six hours. So it's not as though you're just going out for a couple of laps and you can just let your kid, you know, hang in the trailer or something. So, yeah, so she, um, yeah, she's always there supporting us, watching us at every event, every section. She's always there cheering us on. So, yeah, I think I make her pretty proud. So, yeah. Now, explain to me these reliability trials and things like that because if I'm honest, I've never seen anything like it before. I still yep. can't wrap my head around it, but what's the deal? Yep. So we've got to have a road-worthy and road-registered bike which needs to comply to um, all the road rules and regulations. So you've got to have your, your headlights, you've got to have your tail lights, your brake lights, you've got to have... Um, all in working order, you've got to have your reflectors and everything. So um, we travel via dirt roads, public roads, to get to private property sections, and that's where we do our racing. Um, and then you finish the section and you move on via more public roads to the next section. So um, most of our events are about six hours long, so you have two laps of about three hours um, with, you know, some section racing and then obviously um, some transport um, times as well. So it's a bit like a mini Dakar rally in one day. You've done something that not many people have. A friend of mine's done it, another South Australian, uh, Trenton Headland. He's competed in the Fink Desert race. So how was that? Like that would have been torture. Um, it actually wasn't. I think for someone like me who just went um, to ride to finish it, I actually absolutely loved it and I sort of had timed my race like I needed to be at the 80-kilometre mark within a certain time and when I got there, I'm like, what's the time, what's the time? And they said, oh, you know, you, you're 35 minutes up and what you allowed yourself. So it was just cruisy. The whole atmosphere, the whole event was absolutely fantastic. So, yeah, I'd do it again in a heartbeat if it didn't cost so much money. <laughs> Now, I've got to put my hand up for the Jerk of the Year Award. Um, you were actually at Gilman when I was at Easter time in the background when the juniors were going out, and I didn't even connect the dots, but um, I promise it won't happen this time. But 
cool to see you down there. And why were you down there at Gilman with the junior sidecars? So my nephew was given the opportunity to swing um, for Cooper, which is um, a really good friend of my son. So, yeah, the two of them teamed up to have basically almost their first ride together at the Aussie titles. It was a pretty killer event. Like in Queensland, we had a really healthy junior um, sort of alumni years ago and all those kids are now, you know, oh, that would have been 15 years ago. So those kids yep. are all in seniors. But the the junior sort of deal in Victoria and South Australia is killer. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my little girls um, last season just started her first season at Sidewinders on the Pee Wee. And there's more and more kids coming out every week. Um, so it's really good to see. Now, talk about your daughter and racing. What's that like? Um, I'm a very proud mum. <laughs> Um, yeah, she is um, absolutely blowing me away. So we sort of, last season, we just sort of come out and, you know, she, I just let her cruise around and I was trying to give her lots of words of wisdom and she's like, I'll do it my way, Mum, you do it your way. So I'm like, okay, this is going to be a very interesting little career of your racing journey. And But we've had a couple of um, really good mates at Sidewinders over the last month give her some coaching. And just in the last month alone, her improvement has gone in tenfold. So, yeah, so she's done some sidewinders. She does some practicing at Gilman and she's on the infield at Gilman on race nights. And she's also done a motocross race and swung on a peewee sidecar. Isn't it funny though? Like you could be, say, for example, in the motocrossy world, and that you could be, yep. say, Jeremy McGrath or whatever, but you're still not cool because you're the parent. Yep. So, yep. whatever you're saying, it don't matter. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. She don't. She, yeah, she don't want to listen to me, but she's taken on the advice um, from some friends and the coaches at Sidewinders, and it's just paid off big time. So, yeah. Now, you, you've you undergone a, a pretty big transformation in your um, physical appearance over time. Um, how did that affect your racing? Did you have more energy or what was the deal? Um, yes, I would say yes. I mean, I always was um, a pretty fit person beforehand in, anyway, um, but just feel, yeah, it's just feel a million dollars, to be honest with you. Um, it's easier to, you know, move on the sidecar now. You know, I like to, you know, make sure for the left-handers I try and get right in the sidecar and the right-handers I try and get my ass over the bike. And, yeah, it's um, it's definitely a lot easier. And, yeah, I've learned to twist the throttle a little bit more and put a little bit of pace behind us as well. So, but, no, it's, it's definitely, it's changed my life. But how do you keep up your energy levels and stuff like that on such long events? Um, particularly in the 24, that's probably our hardest one where we race for 24 hours straight. We do have a couple of like dinner breaks and breakfast breaks, but you're just constantly um, nibbling on protein bars, bananas at your fuel stops. Um, a lot of control keepers offer lollies, so that's a really big one. Um, some riders and that um, have those little um, little energy sachet things that they drink and that as well. So. Um, and since I've had my operation, like I am very minimal with what I eat um, so, and I can't eat and drink at the same time. So going back racing this year was a little bit of a challenge to try and work out how I'm going to maintain my energy and not, you know, end up chucking my guts up because if I'm having some lollies and then have a big drink of water from the camel pack. So, yeah, so it was a little bit tricky. Um, but, yeah, just sort of try and work that out. You know, my thoughts would be you would just be hammering water the whole time, but you're exactly right. Your body would fill full of water and you wouldn't have yep. anywhere to put the food. Yeah. And see, we don't have the opportunity during the section to have a drink. So it's only once we finish the section that we can have a drink as we're riding down the roads and that. And then when we get to our fuel dump, um, that's where I'll generally have something to eat. 
and have some lollies and that. And then by the time we finish the next section or something, it's probably generally been half an hour and I can have a drink. So, yeah. Now, attention spans. Mine is like a goldfish. I've even got the nickname of um, Dory at Speedway in Brisbane. But how do you keep your focus and how do you keep sort of exactly what you want to do and game plans and something that's that long? Um, we just take each section as it comes. So um, because I've been racing for quite a few years now, a lot of the sections at a lot of the events I have ridden before, so we get to that section, I'm like, oh, this is this section and I have um, a memory like an elephant. So I remember absolutely everything and I'll be talking to my passenger and go, oh, I remember this section, like this has got this in it and this has got this in it. And she's like, I've got no idea what you're talking about. Um, so, yeah, I do have uh, a bit of a photographic memory. Um, so, yeah, we I just take each section as it comes and, you know, as you start in the 24, you're not looking at, oh, I've still got 23 hours to go. You just, oh, yeah, next section, next section. We've, we've got our 44-minute break now for tea. And then we go out, we go, oh, we've got this section, we like this one. We've got, oh, we've got this one we don't really like. So, you know, we try and push harder and faster in the sections that we really enjoy and the sections that are a little bit difficult or, you know, a bit mundane. We, um, we just, you know. ever had the opportunity to be on a, um, a speedway sidecar at all? I have ridden a couple classic speedway events, um, one at Renmark and one or two at Mildura. I think my little girl was only eight weeks old when I rode um, at Mildura on a classic speedway sidecar, so um, absolutely loved it. I did ride a two-stroke and then a four-stroke in the classics, and I much prefer the four-stroke. Um, but that is one of my lifelong goals is to try and get myself a little ride on a modern speedway sidecar. Um, you know, I like to sort of give everything a shot and have a turn at something once and I will never say no. So, Fortunately, I've got a really big mouth and a lot of friends down <laughs> your way now. So uh, I think it's going to happen. Yep. Awesome. The people have so much love for the classics and it's very strong down your state. Like, um, yeah, the classic feels, they, they always present them really nice in that. So with the classic, I've been told and I've seen it where it, everything sort of happens a lot, lot slower than a modern. What was it like to ride a classic? Were they sort of difficult to ride or could you get the hang of it? Um, it was it was tricky because obviously I'd never ridden um, a speedway sidecar before. So obviously, and then just being thrown straight into the classics, it was a little bit harder to handle. Um, and the two-stroke, because everyone else in the race was on a four-stroke, so as soon as I finished the line, the bike just kept flying around the corner. Even, you know, you backed off and put the clutch in. So it took forever. You got no brakes. And it's like, okay, just give me a bit of room here, boys, um, to sort of, you know, slow the bike down. So it was definitely, um, it took me a little bit to get my head around it. But I think by the end, when we went to Renmark, we actually won a race, so I was absolutely wrapped with that. So, yeah, and I like to try and do well and succeed, succeed at whatever I do and whatever I put my hand to. So, yeah, I'll just sort of, you know, take in all the advice um, that I can take um, just to try and, you know, do better and, and be more enjoyable. Me personally, I get a huge kick out of um, helping people and giving them a leg up, whether it be, yep. you know, go shop here because you'll get a good discount or try this or whatever. But in your state, the only other person I've seen that regularly puts up stuff about uh, what you do is um, Kim Menadju. Yep. Yeah. So Kim does the reliability trials as well, um, same discipline as what I do. He swings for John Davies. Um, so, yeah, and then obviously he does the Speedway as well. And um, we've raced motocross together as well about embarrassing moments look I'll, I'll just try and rattle off one off the top of my head for me personally um oh geez i don't know i've countless times because my eyes don't, don't work real great i've looked at a set of kevlars and gone i think i know who that is bang and i'll go to interview them at the track and i'll say totally the wrong name and everything 
they won't even correct me and they'll just keep talking. Yeah. So what's some of your embarrassing moments? Um, probably something a little bit similar. And I suppose in my discipline, we don't have very many females. You could probably, you know, I think this year we might have got six females um, at one event. So a lot of people know me and my face um, and I can have a conversation with someone and then they can walk around away and I go, who the hell was that? And I have no idea who I was talking to. Um, that happens quite often. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, even last week um, we went to Gilman practice and some bloke come up, was to, you know, took a photo of Colby and, you know, had a quick chat to me and they knew who we were, but I had no idea who he was. So... That can be a bit embarrassing sometimes, more so for me, not the other person, because they have no idea. So I actually had a weird experience in a good way at Gilman this year. So as you saw off camera, I get triggered pretty quickly and cry like a sook. But um, I walked in the gates of Gilman and I just lost it. I couldn't believe I was there because I'm such a simple bloke, like very easy, please. But I actually yeah. had a lot of people coming up to me knowing exactly what I do, who I am, what I the whole kit and I was having the same experience where I'd be like, Oh, thank you so much. And I go walk away and they'd said their name two or three times and yep. gone. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's just, you know, humans these days, you've just got so much going on that you just forget the name. And well, you sort of hit something on the head there. I'm actually a big proponent to try and get more women highlighted in what I do. Cause even if it's, um, you know, people in the crowd or whatever, no one really shines a light on women in what this sort of circle and that we do. But I would love to see more women races in, in all forms. Yep. Oh, absolutely. We're lucky here, um, I don't know in other states, but um, MSA, they actually have a women in motorcycling in SA page, Facebook page, and they promote um, a lot of events and promote, you know, what riders have ridden what events and that as well. So um, we do have a lot of promotion here and, and acknowledgement of women in motorcycling. Um, but, you know, it's it, there aren't as many, obviously. It is still a male-dominated sport. And the discipline that I do, um, you do need to have a lot of wits about you. You need to have a lot of bike um, background information because obviously we don't have, we can't have any outside assistance in the reliability trials. So once you start that race, whatever you've got on your bike or whatever you carry in your bum bag and tools and that you need to have to fix any issues that you may encounter, otherwise you become a DNF. So, you know, you're not allowed any outside assistance. And, you know, one lap is three hours long. Um and, you know, if you're doing this, you know, a normal six hour, it's, it's a long time if something goes wrong. And, you know, we're in unforeign territory. We follow arrows and bunting um, around the track. You know, we're dodging trees and we're going over logs and we're going through creeks and rocks and, you know, all sorts of bits and pieces. So, you know, if you drop your bike, you can smash your radiators, you, you break levers. So you need to be able to fix things as you go along. So, we don't see an awful lot of new women come into the reliability trials because I think it's just that much more technical and you need to have that, um, you know, the background information about, you know, trying to fix things as well on your bike. Whereas I think, you know, motocross, you go out, you do a couple of races, you can come in, you've got people to tinker with your bike and change your suspension and, and you know, be your pit bitch. Um, and the same with Speedway and that as well. So, Whereas reliability trials is, you know, it's, it's, and you need, you know, you've got to have a registered bike. You've got to have good lights because we do a lot of night riding as well. So you've got that added expense for the reliability trials as well. So what do you carry in your toolkit? So um, on the sidecar, we actually have quite a large toolbox. So I have, I carry almost everything by the kitchen sink. I carry a spare number plate. I carry a spare chain. I carry um, spare front sprockets, brake pads, spark plugs, ear levers. Um, um, sometimes I carry spare Kickstarter. 
Um, and then I have all my chains, like duct tape, cable ties, um, electrical tape, spare globes, um, lot, basically everything that can go wrong we can fix. And then I've got, you know, containers of nuts and bolts and chain links in case we break a chain and, yeah, lots of spanners, screwdrivers, um, shifters, pliers, side cutters. So, yeah, and then lots of bit of um, wire, electrical wire, um, anything you can just sort of fit in that toolbox that you may need. Um, and I find your race is always one in the shed. So if you can spend a lot of time in the shed to maintain your bike and prep your bike, generally, unless you're going to have a big accident, nothing seems to go wrong. So but touching on accidents, that's obviously a byproduct of racing. You're never gonna, yeah. you're never gonna stop it. You're gonna minimise it because a friend of mine, Davey Watt, he told me this last Saturday. He said that it is far safer to ride a motorbike on a racetrack because everyone's going the same direction, full safety to get everything. But have you had any crashes? And if so, any injuries? Yep. I was 12 weeks pregnant in 2016 doing the Robertstown two-day event. And a few people had found out I was pregnant. I was trying to keep it. My mother has a bit of a big mouth. And so they're like, don't break a leg. First section, first day, first lap, our famous Spring Art Creek, we hit a couple of rocks and, yeah, we crashed big time and I broke my collarbone. And that's the first bone I'd ever broken and only bone that I've ever broken um, from racing. So we've had a couple of other little crashes, you know, you winded yourself, bruise your ribs, get a couple of corkies, but, yeah, that was our biggest. And I feel that I only broke the collarbone because I was pregnant and she was just sucking all the nutrients from my body. So, um, but yeah, she was absolutely fine. Like I had to have a couple of, you know, emergency ultrasounds and that. Um, but yeah, didn't do her any harm, that's for sure. Uh, in my personal life, I've had a lot of broken bones and a lot of injuries. And I found the worst part about an injury is if you're not wearing a giant cast or something, People yeah. don't see how much it actually is affecting you. And the thing I also hate is um, opiates and painkillers. I can't stand them. And see, a lot of my um, injuries in the past have been soft tissue injuries. Um, and, you know, corkies or horrific bruises. Like I've had a couple of like dinner plate size bruises on my leg and, you know, that like, I couldn't um, have anyone touch that. Like the bruise was there for eight weeks and, you know, I've still got a permanent lump from that bruise, whereas the broken collarbone, no issues whatsoever. Just now that, you know, I've lost a bit of weight, it's um, it's not very nice to look at. It's, you know, a bit lumpy and bumpy. and. Well, you're never going to win the grossest collarbone award because that's Dave Bottrell. He has <laughs> the most disgusting collarbone from that many accidents. I love oh, him to yeah. bits, but he is tougher than nails, that dude. No, he, needs, he needs a trophy. He can have that one. I've seen his um, collarbones and, yeah. He's, yeah, he can take that title. I'm happy to, happy for that. This is something I, I've thought about a lot lately. Um, what advice would you give to sort of young up-and-coming teens and stuff like that that, you know, see it, they go to the meetings, you can tell they want to do it, but they are hesitant or scared? Like what advice would you give to them? Um, be persistent and determined, I think. Um. Because obviously I started racing um, at 26, so I was quite late. Um, and, you know, I felt like I had to sort of run it past my mum and my grandfather at the time. And it took me about six months to convince them um, and sort of get their approval to go, I'm actually going to get a motorbike and I'm actually going to race. Um, so obviously, yeah, I had that, whereas... Um, yeah, it, I think you've just got to be determined and just persistent. You know, get out there and, and give it a shot. Like I think life's too short to have any regrets and I don't want to look back, you know, in 40 years' time and go, I wish I'd done that, I wish I'd done that. Um, right now, looking back at my racing career over the last 15 years, I have no regrets. Like I've I've literally done everything that I could possibly do. I, I think I haven't done road racing and that's probably about the, you know, dirt track racing um, are the only sort of disciplines that I haven't sort of done. So, 
you know, and the road racing doesn't really interest me. Um, so, yeah, I just think, yeah, go for it. forgetting things but just mention some of the people that have been really crucial to your ability to be able to ride um so my mum obviously is my number one supporter um i couldn't have done any of this without her um my late um pa um max he has always been um there um without him and his support and encouragement over my first few years of racing i don't think i would have stuck to it or gone as far as what I did. Um, and then obviously once I got a sidecar, obviously I couldn't have done it without the passengers that I've had over the years as well. Um, and my sponsors, we've had, you know, a few sponsors that have, you know, maintained over the years. Um, one of them in being Williston Auto Body Repairs, who um, the owner of the Adrian Bird um, used to race Speedway with my dad. So, you know, it's sort of nice to, you know, sort of catch up with him every now and then. And he paints my frames of the sidecar and that as well. Um, so, yeah. And then obviously my brother, I sort of followed in um, his footsteps in, you know, r- racing sidecars in reliability trials. And obviously the biggest influencing factor would be my father. Um, obviously he died when I was quite young, but every time I race, I always – just feel connected to him and feel like I'm following in his footsteps. And, yeah, he's, he's a bit of a, a guardian angel and, and my hero. So, yeah. Yeah, that's killer. And um, you got to thank the people that are behind you because most of my sponsors are actually from Adelaide at the moment. So, yep. yeah, you're in some good company. But um, thanks for being another female to come on the pole line. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, I feel very blessed to be uh, able to have a chat with you. Yeah, killer, and I uh, look forward to seeing you because I've got a really heavy um, South Australian travel schedule coming up in December. Yeah, I've got two trips to Gilman in the space of two weeks, I think. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, we're there on the hill every two weeks, and Colby generally has a ride um, out in the juniors on the infield prior to the, the race night. So, yeah. Yeah, it'll be killer. I can't wait to catch up. Yep. Yeah.